Hello, explorers. My name is Tim, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this Reach the World live stream event with members of the Endurance 22 Expedition. So many of you have been following this incredible journey for almost a full school year now, so you know all too well that the Endurance 22 Expedition team journeyed from Cape Town, South Africa, to the Weddell Sea in the Antarctic in search of Sir Ernest Shackleton's sunken ship, Endurance. If you missed any part of this adventure or want to join Reach the World's free virtual exchange education program with your K-12 students, please visit explore.reachtheworld.org where you can easily register to join the journey. We just added eight new on-demand itineraries that you will not want to miss. But today we're going to talk all about digital storytelling, one of my favorite topics, the story of Shackleton's amazing survival in the Weddell Sea 107 years ago, and the modern day search for his beloved ship that he had to leave behind is perhaps one of the most interesting and incredible tales anyone can hope to tell. I'm so excited to welcome to the live stream today four members of the Endurance 22 media team whose job it was to tell these incredible stories to the world through the art of digital storytelling. We're going to go behind the scenes of the Endurance 22 expedition today so you can see exactly what it takes to capture the real life excitement of an Antarctic expedition for audiences around the world. And with that, I'm going to bring my friends from the Endurance 22 media team onto the screen. We have Saunders Carmichael Brown. Hey, Saunders. Hi, how's it going? Hi. We have Natalie Hewitt. Hi. We have Paul Morris. Hey, guys. And we have James Blake. Hello. Hello. It's great to see you all. Thanks for joining us today. Good to be here. Lovely to be here. Excellent. It's uh, really nice to reconnect with you. I'm excited to talk about digital storytelling with you. And to get us started, I thought maybe I'd ask uh, Saunders uh, a first question to kick us off and give us a little historical context. Um, I know during the expedition and certainly before and a little bit after too, one of the names that lots of people were talking about was Frank Hurley. Can you tell us who Frank Hurley was and why Frank Hurley is important to storytelling around this expedition? Sure. So, so Frank Hurley was an amazing uh, videographer and photographer who was importantly for this expedition, he was the person on board the ship taking all the photos and making all of the, the films, which for that time in history was revolutionary to have a, a motion picture taking place on a ship like the Endurance in Antarctica was incredible. Uh, he was Australian, known for some pretty interesting camera techniques with lighting, things like that. So he kind of really changed the way that people, he used. Is there, there's one of his classics there from the uh, from the ice itself. But yeah, he was a, a, a legendary photographer and filmmaker who really brought this immense survival story to life. And it was really the work that he did in support of Shackleton kind of having a bit of an, a faith in him, let's say, that really allowed us to know how this expedition went down and the stories that we, we now know from it. All right, thank you for that great overview. Um, certainly has been inspiration to many of us who are preparing to go on this modern day expedition. Um, and even in the case of this photograph, trying to recreate some of the things that he did 107 years ago was, was pretty fun um, using his old photographs that have survived and placing them in context 107 years later. So great, that is Frank Hurley and that was 107 years ago. And now we're gonna fast forward to the modern day Endurance 22 expedition where this team, uh, and we're missing a few members, but we have a great representation of the media team um, who are here to talk about what it was like behind the scenes to try and capture what is really an incredible story and fun story to tell. So I'm gonna advance through, we've got one more picture, an example of a, a Frank Hurley picture um, that survived the, the Imperial Trans Antarctic Expedition amazingly and helped to tell that story. And then we're gonna move on to some of the pictures of filmmaking as part of this expedition. I'm gonna turn it over to Nat and Paul and James to sort of narrate what we're looking at here. So this is, a, this is actually a photo of I think almost all of our camera kit that we had to take to Antarctica. So I think we had maybe 50 bags in total, um, which we had to get on the airplanes and then get on the ship. Um, and uh, James and Paul obviously are used to using this camera kit all the time. But one of the really difficult things about filming in Antarctica is that if your camera breaks, obviously you can't 
go somewhere to get it repaired. Um, so we had to take loads and loads and loads of spares <laughs> just in case things broke uh, because we weren't going to see land again for a really long time. Um, but, you know, James and Paul, I guess you guys can talk a bit about the challenges of getting all that gear down there and uh, what we picked, why we took the stuff that we took. I think one of the main challenges is actually just at the airport, getting the trolleys to the uh, checkout counter. Okay. But once you've done that, um, there's obviously, yeah, there's a lot of kit to to take down there. And as Nat said, we had a lot of, lot of spares on this, on this trip as well, because you can't just pop out and buy anything. Um, and then once you get it on board the ship, the, where we had a good setup, it was kind of just like a studio, or when I say studio, it was their spare library or library that we kind of took over. Um, and we kind of made that our home, I guess. Yeah, I think one of the, the things with the expedition was just how sort of ambitious we were in terms of the way, the way that we were trying to um, create the film. But actually, from a filmmaking perspective, we were relatively we were a relatively small crew. So for the documentary, there were the three of us. Uh, usually on a on a on a project this this scale, you'd have you'd have a lot more people. But that was partly, I guess, a budget thing, and also just there aren't that many beds on the on the ship for everybody. Um, so yeah, a lot of it I think was about trying to sort of make sure that we were able to capture amazing images, uh, even though even though there weren't that many of us to to sort of um, yeah pull together. Yeah, and I guess we did have um, quite a lot of problems filming in the cold. Uh, like lots of things broke. We had to sort of fix them as we could. There were lots of tiny screwdrivers and bits of tape and stuff. Um, but one of the other things that's really interesting about making a documentary about an expedition like this is that as a team, we had to try and film sort of everything that was happening really. You know, there were only three of us, but there were over a hundred people on the ship and they were all doing different jobs all at the same time they were working 24 hours a day and the three of us were trying to figure out um who was doing something really interesting so that we could be there and film it so this picture i think that's you james filming them getting the helicopter out for the first time is that right uh, i think so yeah that was on one of their trial test flights um and i don't it doesn't look that cold but i think it was pretty cold down there you can see ice obviously all around um, and that cold was definitely the uh, the most challenging thing to overcome, um, especially with what you were like the cameras. The cameras actually did quite well. Um, there was a few little issues that we had to try and kind of fix, but it was just your um, your trying to keep your body warm. Um, and mainly when you're operating a camera, fingers because you can't just put your uh, put your hands in your pockets or anything like that. Um, so keeping them warm, you know, you could be outside for a few hours, um, possibly longer um waiting around so there's a lot of a lot of standing around so um i've never used hand warmers before but this job was um yeah opened my eyes to a couple of hand warmers in your gloves uh made a big difference so there's when you're um filming a documentary and you're sort of constantly waiting for something to happen um you end up spending a lot of time sort of watching people and seeing what they're doing and trying to work out if what they're doing is interesting for the story but one of the other amazing things that we got to film when we were in Antarctica was uh, the wildlife and we were really lucky when we were on the back deck of the ship um, watching the underwater drone being launched and recovered and watching the people work there lots of the wildlife just came up to the ship because it was really interested in what we were doing um, so we, you can see some penguins there that was me filming some penguins because I love penguins they're probably my favorite animal um, so it was really nice whenever they came to visit us um, and then Paul you you actually were the brainchild of a very exciting device which we used to film the penguins underwater. Yeah, I mean, device, I think, is, uh, yeah, uh, underwater device. So when we, during pre preparation, we uh, back in London, we were talking about how we were going to get some underwater shots. Because um, obviously a lot of our story takes place underwater, and so we wanted to try and uh, capture that as, as best as possible. Um, but we didn't have the budget or the crew or... You know, a lot of time on film film shoots, you're able to bring in a drone team or an underwater team for certain sections of a film. But obviously, we were thousands of miles away from from land and from 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 anywhere, and we just didn't have the you know capacity to take an underwater uh, underwater unit um, to to Antarctica with us. Um, so when during preparation, we found uh I, I guess what you'd call like just a very long selfie stick 
that cost about sort of five hundred dollars, and uh, and uh, some of us were, were concerned that that maybe was a, a sort of waste of money. Um, but we were able to rig GoPros onto that um, onto that very very long. I think it was like a thirty foot, uh, ten meter selfie stick. And we're able to sort of just put that down on under uh, under the water, so we could get maybe about five or six meters under the water. And actually, so even at that depth, you see some incredible things. So the seals, whales, penguins diving in and out of the water. Um, and some of that footage was some of uh, yeah, it was kind of magical to capture. And I think we were all really inspired uh, inspired by those images. So this is um, another photo of us at work. I think that might be Paul, but it could be James. You, it's really difficult to see, but right at the end of that long we, green pole, you can see someone. We basically right just wrap in. ourselves up, right? So we all look the same. <laughs> like right in there with the guys with the fluorescent jackets on. Um, and basically, this is sort of where we spent a lot of our time being snowed on in the wind and the snow and the cold, because this is where they were launching the AUV. And Paul and James <laughs> spent many, many hours here waiting for them to find the endurance. And it's a really difficult thing making a documentary. I think you don't realize until you do it how much time you spend waiting around um, and how much you time you spend just sort of trying to figure out what people are doing and, and what's happening. Because often, you know, you're filming people who are doing their jobs. So they're really focused on what they're doing. And you as a documentary crew have to sort of find a way to be there and to film them but without interrupting their job because what they're what they're doing actually this this area of the ship is quite a dangerous area there's lots of cranes moving around there's lots of equipment moving around so we had to work really carefully to make sure that a we were working safely um around all that equipment but also that we were letting the, the people who were trying to find the endurance um get on with their work and uh, i don't know if you guys want to talk about some of your <laughs> long long shifts <laughs> in the cold waiting for that AUV to, oh yeah, <laughs> this is, so this is us, you know, this is how you fill your free time when you're in a ship. Um, <laughs> Paul and I had a terrible attempt at making a snowman, let's yeah, be honest. Can we call that a snowman? I don't well, know. Well, I called it a snowman. <laughs> Weirdly, it's very difficult to make a snowman in Antarctica because it's so cold that the snow didn't stick together. So actually, mm. I think we deserve gold star. <laughs> and then the other photo shows, I don't know if you can see, James's eyelashes uh, got so cold that they froze. <laughs> yeah, the, the eyelashes go quite quickly and then the if you've got a slight moustache or anything like that, that seems to freeze up um, very quickly. So it is it is pretty cold. On, on some of the colder nights when the wind was blowing, it was getting down to kind of minus 20 and below that. Um, so stuff freezes very quickly. So you do have to cover up. I think I had a balaclava, a, hood, a hoodie. And then also a beanie and then a hard hat there. So, um, and I was, my, my skin was all right. It's just around the eyes where your skin's showing. That's when it um, gets a little bit sore. But um, yeah, it, it's not too bad. I really like these photos because I witnessed how hard all of you worked uh, to capture this story on the ship. But this is also proof that you can have a little bit of fun along the way as well. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, Paul, I think it is one of the better snowmans you've built. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you obviously have to have a sort of really good relationship with the people you work with. And so this is, I guess, British uh, sar sarcasm, I guess, is, is what you call it. I mean, one thing I'd just like to say quickly, so, so the way that, so Nat was directing the whole operation, but then James and I would do 12 hour shifts each. Um, and luck I think luckily for us, we would say that like at that time in Antarctica, because it's in the Southern Hemisphere, we were only getting about an hour and a half, two hours of, of dark. So it was light for 22 hours a day. Um, and and that, I think, sort of meant that you could sort of morale was better than if we'd have been shooting, say, in the Arctic, and it would have been sort of dark all day. But James definitely got the short story on shift. So I did midday to midnight, and he did midnight to midday. Um, so the sort of the colder, more sort of harsh uh, time was uh, James was heroic and 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 captured some amazing stuff during that time. No, nope. there weren't that many people up at that time, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this photo, um, I thought it'd be nice to tell you a little bit about some of the really specialised kit that we took with us to help us film the endurance expedition because um, it was a really complicated project actually. So this is a shot which shows the monitor um, showing. 
a feed from each of the four mini cameras that we put inside the hut where the people who were driving the AUV, the underwater drone, would sit. So the, the people in this hut are basically the people who are operating the AUV. They are making sure it's working properly and they are also operating all of the um, sensoring equipment on it to try and look for the, the endurance. And so I guess, um, Paul and James, it's quite, maybe you can talk about how complicated actually it was for us to kind of come up with this rig and what we had to think about when we were doing it and sort of why why it works i suppose um i think that the the, the mini cameras are, are going to be a very key part and, and were a key part of the documentary because um we couldn't sit in there the whole time we would annoy them um you would miss stuff um you'd probably end up chatting you'd you'd, you'd ruin the shot basically if you sat in there um so to have these cameras rigged there we were getting some really unique behavior um of their reactions and you know it always takes a while for people to get used to cameras um and these guys knew they're being filmed in there but um you know they're they get they let their guard down i think on these on these kind of uh rigs so you can actually get some really nice um you know chats and you get relationships building up and you know it's it's really important for the story I'd say um james i know part of your your job title is area aerial cameraman something like that can you describe lots of people are interested in the use of drones um as part of this film project can you describe how you used uh drones yeah i think the drones are really important just because it gets you off the ship and it gets you up uh up and out and off the boat um so that is um very important for the storytelling um the cold had quite a bit of uh, kind of that was my main worry about actually about using drones down there um as uh they tend to the battery life is a little uh a little bit less if it's cold so um but actually we it got on just fine actually there's quite a lot of conditions we couldn't fly in um but it, it meant we could get some um some incredible stuff um especially the kind of the ship going through breaking through the ice at night. Those are the stuff um, that I really, really enjoyed filming. And uh, this is a picture of a very special camera assistant who we came across uh, on our way home. We stopped at an island called South Georgia, which is an Antarctic island. And it's actually the place where Ernest Shackleton is buried. And we had a very short time there. And uh, we had we wanted to film a very special sort of moment for the expedition crew going to see um, the place where Shackleton is buried. Um, but we got an unusual camera assistant. I don't know uh, if Paul and James want to talk about the challenges of filming on South Georgia. There were a few, not least the lack of time and the lack of light. But there were also hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these little fur seals who were running around. And this guy kind of seemed to want to kind of help us out because he kind of guarded our kit for us while we were filming. Yeah, I mean, when we got on uh, got South Georgia, as, as sort of Nat alluded to, we were a bit strapped. Stra we, we we thought we were going to get there in the morning. We ended up getting there in the afternoon. And you know, when you're filming things, you, you know, you really you really really want time. And so without that time, uh, things start to be a bit more panicked. But we got to this island, and it's stunning. It's crazy, crazy beautiful. And uh, everywhere, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of these beautiful little seals that kind of ran the place. Really, it was it was there. It was their sort of home, and we were were intruding. And they sort of went from being kind of very, very cute to like, uh, I don't know whether it feels like it's sort of in my mind that over the, the sort of the five or six hours we were there, they became sort of more and more aggressive. So we'd have to, we'd be sort of filming and then all of a sudden you'd hear one of them sort of charging towards you to sort of take a nibble on your uh, on, on your leg. I mean, luckily, luckily nobody was injured, uh, but um, I mean, they're stunning things. But yeah, we, uh, we, we didn't want to outstay our welcome. All right. Well, thank, thank you all so much for that great overview of sort of the challenges and the things you were thinking about as you were making the documentary film, collecting the footage that you'll need for that film. All of us will get the chance to see the results of your work um, very soon in the forthcoming documentary, which I'm very excited about. Um, I'm going to add Saunders back and put the rest of you back screen for a moment so we can switch over a little bit and talk about um, one of the unique forms of media that um, Ernest Shackleton probably never would have imagined possible, um, but was a really big part of the 
expedition. So Saunders, do you want to talk a little bit about um, what your work was like on the ship? Yeah, sure. So as well as the, the documentary that was going on, as the guys were just talking about, we also had this opportunity to be telling the story as it happened. You know, this is a really incredible expedition that was was hoping to uncover an amazing bit of history. So bringing people along the way through every bit of the expedition, not necessarily just the searching for the shipwreck, but, you know, the experiencing the Antarctic conditions, the voyage on the, on the ship itself, the weather, the science that was going on, all these kind of different stories that we wanted to tell and tell as they were happening. So it actually gave us a really cool opportunity to use some of the social media platforms that are available now, you know, things like Facebook and TikTok and bring these stories and the, the behind the scenes aspect of all the work we were doing to people as they were happening, even with some live streams in some in some cases, which was, which was really cool. This is actually probably one of my favorite moments uh, of the whole expedition. And I'll, I'll tell you why it's because not only is this just an incredible bit of nature happening in front of us a massive wave at the side of the ship while whilst i'm filming dan there for a history hit documentary but what he's saying at this exact moment is massive waves so we could it could not have timed better that it's in the final film as well that's up on history hit now as he says they he's talking about the original story as he says they were hit by massive waves this massive wave turns out right to the right hand side of him and almost covers him in water so you couldn't have timed it better but um, we had lots of little moments like that. I really like this picture because it captures something that I think all of us felt on the ship, which was that there were big waves and swells all around. But when you're thinking about how you're going to tell that story through still photos or video, you have to really like frame it in a special way. Like it's something that we felt, but I'm not sure everybody could have translated it into an image like this that really allows someone who wasn't there to feel the power of the sea, the open ocean, uh, the way this image does. Sure, sure. And I mean, it was, it was quite challenging to filming in these conditions as well, because this, that's a, a static image that we're looking at now, but the boat is moving a lot that day and it was quite hard to keep stable on your feet. So you're obviously trying to think about how you can keep the camera steady at the same time to make sure the shot looks nice. So it's uh, you get a little bit more leeway when it comes to social media because it's kind of a bit more in the moment and and a little, and a bit more there's more forgiving us let's say so um but still you still want to kind of do the best job you can and the nature with the waves like this and the ship and the ice and the snow as Nat was saying earlier it does a uh, it does cause it to be a bit more difficult sometimes but it was an amazing experience to be able to do this and on the social media kind of things side, side of it as well is we it allowed us to tell some of the sub stories that were going on so you know like I said earlier as well as the history so what I was doing with Dan and and another guy called Nick and we were telling the story of the original expedition the endurance expedition whilst being in the locations of the, of the story itself so when we were talking about you know a, an intense ocean crossing with big waves we were in an intense ocean the same ocean and experiencing the same big waves in a much bigger ship of course but still experiencing the same weather same with the ice same with the snow same with the temperatures we were kind of trying to tell the story as close to the original as possible and get get it get dan as the as the host as close to the the history that he was talking about as well this is a lo lovely snap from our, our journey back in fact you can see paul shooting some nice uh, i think sunset of the of some waves and nick kind of a uh, looking over and then there uh, a shot of a, a little i guess the behind the scenes action of paul and james on the right there on the back deck of the ship but yeah it was really it was really great to be able to work on the social media side of things because we were able to get feedback and comments from people watching on on the you know, daily so we, we knew what people were interested in it allowed us to be able to go and show more of that even to the point of you know TikTok comments we could have somebody saying I want to know what you're eating and then the next day we could make a video about how you feed 100 over 100 people on a ship or how they keep food fresh for two months and things like that so it, it really allowed us to tell a lot of different stories and I really enjoyed that as well having that kind of two-way conversation with people watching from their sofas and their houses all over the world and then us on the ship being able to show them uh, what they were interested in not just uh kind of making videos about stuff but live in some cases which is really cool this is a great picture and a great moment as well one day we were out on the ice and there was a lot of penguins on the stage you can see but they were all absolutely fascinated by dan's orange coat to the point where they would follow him around and he's actually got a really good selfie where he's sitting on a bit of ice 
um, and he's holding the camera up to his face and there is just an emperor penguin just crouching right next to him just looking at his jacket and I don't know why that is I wonder if it's because it's such a vibrant color that they're not used to they just see a lot of you know bright and dark colors they don't necessarily see a lot of vibrant oranges and reds and greens like that so I wonder if that was what made them so interested about the big red ship and and Dan's big orange coat Another here's a great example of actually how inquisitive this the wildlife were. This is our camera kit laying on the ice while we were shooting something else. We turn around and these group of emperor, emperor penguins are right over in our kit. They're sniffing about the cameras. They're interested. No, nothing was. They weren't scared of anything. They weren't scared of us. They were just. They were curious. And it was a. Uh, it was really interesting to, to be to experience that. Obviously, making sure not to get too close because this is their habitat. You know, we're visitors and we need to be respectful of that. But allowing them to just kind of see them going about their day and how they're interested by things and how they hunt in the water as well, how they fish, how they get in and out of the water. It's amazing to see them fly out of the water, okay, almost four foot, four or five foot in the air and then land on their bellies, crawl on their bellies before standing up. This is a well, actually one of my favorite snaps of James. So this, this, when I look at this photo, it reminds me of a few points in the day where Nick, Dan and I would be filming the social media and the history hit um stuff and we'd go we'd kind of be at different points of the ship and every and then we'd go to a point like this where we could see what the documentary crew were doing and it's just kind of like seeing their face and if they're smiling you know things are going well and it was just really nice to have those little moments every day uh this is a, a snap i think esther the expedition photographer took this this snap of nat on the ice with the scientists and um and lucy the expedition doctor uh, but you can see, look, that's not, you know, camera on, on the knees, in the ice, really getting up close and personal with the scientists to tell that story. So there really wasn't anything. There was no uh, corner cutting with making that documentary. So I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how it comes out as well. And now the classic, the full team. There we are uh, at, at the uh, the wreck site. Great little snap yeah. this. Love it. Awesome. Yes, this is the full media team. I thought it would be a good picture to end on. Um, obviously, a fair deal of fun was had along the way, but uh, it was incredible as sort of a, an observer of your work to see all the amazing things that this team did to capture this story and all of its nuance. Um, and you can see a lot of that on social media, Saunders and Nick and Dan Snow's work, and also in the forthcoming film, which I just can't wait to see because I was looking over shoulders into monitors and things during some pretty extraordinary shots, and I, I just can't wait to see it on film. So uh, this has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you all. We have a classroom in St. Louis um, that is excited to ask some questions of you. So I know that they have a limited amount of time today, so I want to make sure and bring on the second grade class at Northside in St. Louis so they can say hello, and maybe we can get through a few of their questions. Hey, Hi. Northside. Let's get you unmuted. Here we go. Hello. Hello. Thanks for letting us join in. This is Ava. Go ahead, Ava. Hi. My name is Ava, and my question is, what inspired you to be a photographer? Nice. All right. Who, James, who wants to talk about their, their career um, inspiration? I, I always um, knew that I wanted to be a photographer um, as my father used to have a lot of cameras lying around. So I always had an interest from when I was um, very young. I was always interested in still photography when I was younger. Um, and then I got into editing. I loved playing on computers um, and mi mixing around footage, um, which then got me into filmmaking. Yeah, my story is slightly different. I, um, I, I didn't study photography or learn much about photography, but I got a job working for a television company after university and I was working as a researcher. And I was so jealous of the, the photographers and the directors and the, and the camera people sort of going off to these incredible places to make these incredible films. Uh, and so that really kind of like started a, a, a sort of an interest in, in, in really sort of, yeah, finding a job that would, would, would enable me to go to places like Antarctica. And the thing with being a photographer and a, or a cinematographer, as we sort of call the moving, moving image version is you have to be where the things are taking place. So you can't sit in an office and you can't, 
uh, you know, you can't be behind the desk. You have to, you have to be where those things are, are happening. Um, so that was, that was the thing that sort of, yeah, kickstarted my, my love of photography. All right. Thank you both. Um, we'll let the rest of you answer subsequent questions. Uh, I want to get Ava, great question. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else, else at Northside who would like to ask a question of the Endurance 22 media team? Hi, my name is Kalia. And hi, my name is Kalia Walker. And my question is, are you going to put anything interesting in your movie? What is the are you going to put anything interesting in your movie, Nat? No. Nah. Uh, only really boring things. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the movie is going to be really interesting because I think what I really enjoy about making documentaries is when you know when you see something like this, which is a really big moment in history, and people all over the world are really interested in the finding of the endurance. But when you see it on the news, it's only, you know, maybe a couple of minutes long and you only get to find out a very small amount about what happened. And what I really like about making documentaries is that you get to tell the whole story. You know, you get to find out who the people were who made this happen, because actually what's really incredible is the people who, who ran this expedition and took part in the expedition and and actually found the endurance are, are really inspiring in themselves and they've all you know wanted to do this for a long time and they've all you know given a lot to go on this expedition to go on the ship for two months and go to Antarctica and get very cold um and actually I, I don't want to give anything away but the finding of the endurance was not very easy so there's lots of challenges there's lots of things that happened lots of things broke lots of things went wrong um and obviously i know what they we all know what they were but um no one else knows what they are yet so i'm really excited to be able to tell everyone when we make the documentary <laughs> all right thank you nat great great question from Northside. um anybody else ready to ask another question of our guests Oh, there we go. Hello. Hi, my name is Aaliyah, and my question is: Did um did your cam did the code like fog up your camera? And if it did, what did you wipe the camera off with? That's a good question because I'll let James and Paul talk more about how they look after the cameras. But when you go from outside in the cold to inside in the warm, then cameras do fog up quite a lot. So you have to find ways to try and stop that from happening. I think the main the main issue we had with the cold, because it's so dry down there, when you go from outside to inside, there's not too much moisture moisture. So the fog's not too much of an issue. The main thing that we had with the cold was that um, with the LCD screen that you look at on the actual camera, it was getting uh, it was working very slowly. So you, it looked like there was a blur on it almost sometimes. Um, and we would put a, we'd, um, if we were out for a while, you'd put a heat pack on the back of it. Um, and that seemed to uh, fix that issue. That was, that was such an excellent question. Very, very good question. I'm going to add a question from our chat for you all, it should appear at the bottom of the screen. Uh, from our friends in Brazil, how did the media team prepare for this expedition? Was there any kind of training? Were you like doing curls with your, your equipment, <laughs> getting your camera muscles strong? Well, we all did the sea survival training, didn't we? Which was what we needed to know how to survive on lifeboats, um, how to prepare for cold water and the different equipment you can do to help rescue if you need it. Um, but other than that, I guess Nat, you had you were kind of our training. You you had the ex <laughs> expedition, and you were you yeah. were telling us all the tricks. Yeah. So the expedition team themselves, um, the people who were trying to find the endurance, they planned for three years before we went to Antarctica. Um, but I started on the project many months before we went to Antarctica. So I probably spent three or four months. Um, planning and you know that included everything from finding out who was on the expedition team and what their jobs were I went to France um, to watch them testing all of the equipment all of the AUV equipment and um, lots of other equipment they were taking with them so that I could understand how, what their job was going to look like when we were in Antarctica and what the best way to film it might be and then 
we all as a media team had to have lots and lots of meetings and planning meetings to decide what equipment we would take and when would we go and how would we work um and yeah it was it was a lot of hard work actually and we had sort of a week didn't we all together before we went um where we went through all the plans and we had lots of meetings and we talked a lot about how to stay safe in the cold and um yeah sort of got everyone together to try and make sure we were all prepared and there was a lot of packing as well a lot of packing <laughs> all right great great question great answer i see another student at northside all ready to go so that's Get, get him up for this question. Hi, my name is Houston, and I want to know if, what tools do you wish you had that you never had? Great question. Mm. Any, anybody? I mean, I think it, in particular. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think best, I, it's a great question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, for us as a filming team, it would have been, and we sort of touched on it earlier, it would have been amazing if we could have had an underwater unit so that we could have we could have filmed the underwater drone while it was doing its work. Uh, the, the, the complications with that are, you know, the expense and um, anything that's sort of working at 3,000 meters under, under the water needs to be able to deal with such incredible pressure. Um, so the cost of, of bringing out a team like that to the point where we never really discussed it, but that would be something if I, uh, if we could do this all again, Houston, with with uh, uh, with a massive budget, then then yeah, an underwater team uh, that can go down to three thousand meters would be would be my uh, my wish. All right, very good, Saunders. You want to add something? Yeah, the one thing I'd say is I'm not sure if it's even possible because I think we were pushing the boundaries of internet connection pretty much to the extremes as as we were. Um, but to, sometimes it was super frustrating when you really want to make a live stream work or you really want to make a, a an upload work to bring someone closer to the story, uh, closer to the expedition. You can't because the internet's just saying no. And you, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just where you are in the world. There's not the connection. So if there was a way to make that magically happen, then I would say that. <laughs> All right. Very good. I'm going to do some rapid fire questions from the chat. Barb has some technical questions about filming in Antarctica that I know you know the answers to. We'll, we'll get through a bunch of them. Um, James, how many different cameras did, did uh, you use aboard the ship as part of this filming project? Um, I think five, possibly. Five cameras, all right. Um, Four cameras, I think. Great. Um, Nat, did you do any um, editing on, aboard the ship? I didn't, no. So not for the documentary because um, with a documentary, you kind of want to know the whole story before you start editing. So I don't tend to edit before I know the whole story. But Saunders did some editing because yeah. he was making social media videos and loads of cool stuff um, as we were going along. So there was editing happening on the ship. Saunders, do you want to add to that? What kind of editing were you doing? So, yeah, we were making things for, for social media. So for Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, everything like that. Um, but also we were you, we were taking some of the shots filmed by these guys, the drone shots, the kind of more uh, generic things, not ne nothing telling the story of the expedition, but more, you know, the ice and that sort of thing. And we were sending them back to news outlets. So when they could tell the story of what we were doing, they had something that they could play. You know, they could say, look what these guys are doing. Here's some shots of them on the ice. Here's some shots of the boat, that kind of thing. So I was doing a bit of editing for that. Um, and this is maybe another question for you, Saunders. How much data did you collect and how do you transport that much data uh, off of the ship and back to the editing studios in London? So I think for the the social media team, it, was a, it, was, it wasn't too much. I think it was about uh, just over a few terabytes of footage captured. But and, and only about maybe I think maximum five gigabytes sent back because we deliberately tried to make the file sizes really small so they would be able to be sent back uh, more efficiently. But for the documentary, we're, we're I think we're 147 terabytes in the end. Yeah. And do you know what? Today we actually did the sums today. So this is breaking news. Uh, we have over one and a half thousand hours of footage. <laughs> big job wow. narrowing that down wow. to a, a 90 minute film wow um great <laughs> thank you for those answers and paul for you um there's a question from barb about um whether or not the 
the cold, the extreme cold shortened the battery lives, battery life of cameras and how you dealt with that. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's something that we thought about, we'd, we'd sort of taken into consideration. So as James said, we took four main camera bodies and then and a bunch of others, and we took a ton of batteries, lo loads of batteries. But actually, actually, I felt that the, the sort of battery life was better than, than we expected. And I think that's a lot, a lot down to sort of modern technology. You know, I was filming seven or eight years ago in Siberia, and that we were losing batteries, you know, 20%. Uh, we were getting 20% of what we were expecting just because of the extreme cold. But actually this time, maybe we were losing 10%, something like that. But it wasn't hugely noticeable. Is that fair, James? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it wasn't wasn't too bad, I'd say. I think, and we were kind of going in and out, in and out. So it gave the battery a bit of time to warm up. But um, yeah, I was quite impressed, actually. It, um, yeah, that's coming a long way. Very good. All right. That was our rapid fire round of, of questions. I'm going to see if we have uh, a student Super. at Northside uh, who would like to ask. Their Hi, my name is Amora. And... <clears throat> Hi, my name is Amora. And I have a question. Did a penguin come up to you and take your camera and walk away. Any, anybody have a, a particularly worrisome interaction with a penguin who might have wanted to take a piece of your equipment with them? A few, few close calls. I think for sure. There's a few I think there's one point where we were we were lying on our stomachs trying to take photos of the pe of other penguins on the ice, and then as we turned around, there was just a kind of penguin leering over <laughs> leering over us, which is quite startling. But uh, no, they didn't take any cameras, thankfully. The the penguins were um, could actually be a bit of an issue because you'd you you take quite a long lens to film them because um, that's what you think you think a penguin's going to be quite far away from you, so you get set up. Um, and then they become, they get so close to you that you can't actually film them on that lens. So it's, um, yeah, it can be a little bit tricky. It's a great, great question. Um, we probably have time for about one or two more questions from Northside. Uh, if, if you have some more, some great questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, great questions, Gary. All right, I see our next question asker coming up to the camera. Go ahead when you're ready. My name is Messiah, and I wonder, are your cameras waterproof? Mm. Were your cameras waterproof, or how did you protect against the snow and the cold and protecting your, your sensitive technology? Yeah, so, so it, yeah, it is a, a really good question. And we did have, we took it, I don't know if you guys know what GoPros are, but GoPros are very, very small cameras. Um, and they are waterproof, so we're able to put those underwater. Um, but the main cameras that we were using, some Sony cameras, they they weren't uh, waterproof. And and you know, filmmaking is always about uh, uh, sort of having the best the best technology, but also knowing when something more uh, old school will do. And so James and I uh, and Nat, when we were and and, and so on as when we were uh, going out when it was particularly snowy. Uh, and we knew the cameras were going to go, get wet, we would clip plastic bags around our cameras, which doesn't sound very National Geographic, um, but um, ultimately is, is the most sort of flexible, flexible solution. And actually, Good we question. didn't get loads of snow. It didn't snow loads and loads when we were there. It was super, super cold. But actually, it wasn't snowing every day, which meant that some days it was really sunny and nice and it was much easier to film. But when it was really snowing, yeah, plastic bags. You can get very fancy covers for cameras, but actually a plastic bag is just as good. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Great question. I see our next question asker at Northside ready to go. Go ahead when you're ready. My name is Raquel and my question is, what was the best thing that you got on your camera with this, with the long selfie stick? Oh, that's a really good question. Paul, you'll be the one to answer that. <laughs> we'll let Paul answer that. 
I mean, there's two answers. The first was um, being able to tell people how valuable the selfie stick was. So that was one of the best things we got, particularly Nick Burwhistler, who isn't here. Uh, but then we got some great, we got some great images, and hopefully, I don't know if you, you're able to see them because, they, but they did go on social media. But we got some incredibly beautiful seals that were swimming around the GoPro, and we also got some penguins jumping in and out of the. Uh, in and out of the water, which is really fun to watch. And I think, am I right, Sons? I think we got some whales. Did we see some whales in the distance? Um, it's a bit of a blur. Yeah, the whale one point, yeah. Yeah. So All whales, right. seals, and penguins, uh, Messiah. Yeah. Great, great question, Messiah. Thank you so much, Miss Turney's class in St. Louis. You are just amazing with your wonderful questions. Is there anyone else? Oh, it looks like you might be ready to go. We're going to say goodbye to you, and I'll even actually – let me see if I can unmute you so that you can say goodbye to her. Bye. 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 Uh, so nice, Ms. Turney's class. Thank you for joining us today. I want to close today with just one sort of round-robin question for all of you. Um, and Masaya almost did it for me. She, she asked, what was your favorite, uh, your favorite shot? Uh, but not specifically with, uh, with the GoPro. Is there something that you – sort of captured on film that you're really proud of or you're excited to see as part of a future project or something that that you captured in a way that you think really uh, rep well represents what it was like to be on the expedition. Um, I'll give those of you who look like you're in deep thought an extra minute. <laughs> it looks like maybe Nat is ready to go. Nat, if you want to go first. Uh, I think... She's never in deep thought. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I think... James actually reminded me of this yesterday, so I hope he's not annoyed for stealing his idea. But um, at the end of the expedition, when we were on the way home and we we were sort of we didn't have as many things to film because they'd obviously found the endurance and we were going home. Um, I'd had this idea about there's a poem that Ernest Shackleton really loved um, and he had it on his wall in in his cabin in the endurance. And while we were filming, I talked to Menson Bound, who was the marine archaeologist, about this poem, and it just stuck in my head. And I thought it would be really nice to try and get different members of the expedition to read the poem to us on camera. Um, I had no idea what we'll do with it. I have no idea if it will make it into the into the documentary. I would love to do something with it because it was so beautiful hearing people, you know, the team, the expedition team were from all around the world. They were all different ages, um, all different backgrounds, um, but they all read the same poem and it was a poem that was very special to Shackleton. And yeah, we just spent a day. Um, we used James and Saunders cabin as our studio. We made a little studio in there. Um, and yeah, we just had people coming in all day and reading this really beautiful poem. And I think that was really special. And some of the people who read the poem also told us about what it meant to them that they had been introduced to it by their father or someone special to them and it also held meaning for them and it, for me it was just really lovely to hear um that poem over and over again and to to hear how people felt about it and why it was so special for this expedition excellent Nat. thank you very much um anybody eager to go next <laughs> um i think for, for me um some of the shots we got at night, looking back at the boat um, from the air, from the drone, um, really kind of showed how isolated we were, um, and it kind of looks like another another planet uh, when it was when it was completely dark and you just had the light shining out from the ship. You have all the shadows that would be casted over the little ice ridges, um, and yeah, it just looked like you're on this kind of ice planet and um, in the middle of absolute nowhere um and for me that's um you know that's a big part of the story so it was um and i you know um yeah i love i love looking at the shots because they'd um hopefully show yeah that isolation all right james thank you very much yeah. um uh, paul go ahead if you're ready yeah so mine's a little bit of a maybe cheap but it was something uh there was something that the saunders showed in, in in some of the photographs and it was on, when we're on the way back and and one of the things about sort of the, the 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 shifts that we did and the way we worked is actually we didn't get a lot of time to spend sort of all six of us together. Everybody was working so hard. We were working 24 hours and, and we didn't have a day off. I think we had one day off in sort of a month. Um, and we all went down to the to the back of the ship and we actually 
filmed what was essentially a very uh, a very extravagant selfie um, where we we put the cameras on slow motion and we all stood there and looked at the camera and it was very silly um, but it was uh, you know when if you're lucky enough in life to to get to go on these amazing adventures and I hope hope you all will will have the opportunity a lot of it is really about the the sort of people uh, that you you go there with and those experiences you share together and so for me that was um, that was a very special uh, piece of, of of filming all right thank you paul and last but not least saunders um i think we're, we're getting to work with with dan snow a lot and have have him recite on camera bits of the original diaries or also his personal opinion on some of the, the key moments that we were talking about whilst being in the same locations that we're, we were talking about. Uh, that was really nice to kind of have Dan have these moments where he got, kind of went from a script into the reality of what he was saying, where he was. And you can just see this transition of him actually really realising where, where he was and the, how kind of significant that was to the story that we were telling. So I really enjoyed those moments. And that kind of, again, was true with that photo we saw earlier with the big wave, um, which was timed just perfectly. But now looking back on the expedition, some of my, some of the nice, well, nicest things I like looking at are all the little moments, uh, like Paul was saying, that we got to share together, whether that is a, a photo of us playing a board game or a photo of us having a sing-along in one of the lounges at, in the night um, on an evening on the way home. Just things like that. Just the things, yeah, you remember from those little experiences. but. It was very special for sure. Well, thank you, Saunders. I really appreciate the fact that now that this expedition, the active portion of the expedition is over, your hard work has helped all of us preserve, you know, the memories and the stories of what happened on the ship. As everybody else on an expedition is looking in one direction at a whale, I always, I could turn over and count on the, the documentary crew to be looking back in the other direction, you know, capturing a really creative angle or, or getting a unique perspective on this story that will help all of us understand and remember it uh, long after it's over. So it's been a real pleasure to see you all today and to listen to your digital storytelling behind the scenes moments. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks to all the students and our, our, on, our live stream audience today. Um, until next time, I think our, our classroom has gone on. They are maybe off to lunch. So I will be the one to say goodbye today. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank hey, you, Tim. Bye -bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.